overview of what our class will be like uh, going forward for the next 15 or 16 weeks. And we will also be talking about uh, the, the four questions that you guys have there, right there on the, on the first page. Uh, we're going to be answering those tonight. So let's, let's start with the logistics for the class. So this is, tonight is the intro class. And as you see on the back of the first page, you have your class schedule. And what we're going to be doing is going through each book of the Minor Prophets in, in the chronological order uh, each week. And so uh, next week's Obadiah, and we're going to go all the way through, all the way to Malachi. Uh, and then depending on um, how we are ending it and, and what we're seeing, we might do a few classes at the end that kind of tie it all together. Um, and we'll, but we'll see as we get there. Uh, one thing to note, on March 9th, uh, we are going to have a break week that week because um, some of us will be out of town. But this is our schedule. We'll try to stick to it. Uh, you guys all submitted an email address. And so if we have an issue that arises, mainly probably like snow or ice, and we need to cancel the class, there will be an email sent out. So... The email address that you put there, if that's your spam email, then <laughs> make sure that you check it uh, if the weather looks risky. Okay, so look at the four questions there on the sheet. Um, we're going to be looking at the context of, of the Minor Prophets, so kind of the history of Israel leading up to the events and the time frame of the Minor Prophets. We are going to look at how, how we study the Minor Prophets. And it, that's for us as teachers, how we study the Minor Prophets to teach, but also for you as, as just a student of the Bible. How do you read the Minor Prophets? How do you study them? Uh, we're going to ask the question, what will we see in the Minor Prophets? And there's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going to see, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, and lastly, we're going to talk about reasons why we should study the Minor Prophets. Uh, but let's go over kind of what you guys were just talking about um, in, in your familiarity and even your goal for the class. Uh, our goal as teachers um, is to teach God's Word to you clearly. Uh, it's to help you understand God's Word better and to equip you so that you can work through the, the, the minor prophets for yourself uh, with your own ability to study the, God's Word and to read and understand. Uh, so that's our goal as teachers. Your goal as a student, on the other hand, can be all over the place. Um, maybe you don't really know anything about the Minor Prophets. Or maybe you've only read them like a few times, or maybe you've never even read all of them. Well, this is a great class because we're going to be uh, exposing you to that. We're going to be doing it all together. That's totally fine. We're glad you're here. We're not going at a pace, or a, we're going at a fast pace, but we're not going at an in-depth pace uh, where we'll lose you, uh, and we're glad you're here with us. Uh, maybe your goal is to see how the minor prophets connect with the whole Bible. Uh, and so you're looking for the themes and the promises that are in the Old Testament and seeing how they're carrying into the minor prophets and how those jump into the New Testament. Uh, maybe you're looking at how the, the minor prophets are referenced in the New Testament, and so you want to get a better idea of what the minor prophets say in the Old Testament. Maybe your goal is to study comparative Hebrew linguistics in the Book of the Twelve, and if that's your goal, then you're in the wrong class. Um, so you need to be somewhere else. Uh, so we're, we're going to be going fast. We're going to be going through a book each week, which means uh, next week it's Obadiah, and news alert, Obadiah is one chapter, so starting off really easy there. Um, some, some books, though, have, have many more chapters, um, and so... We're going to have to kind of adjust the, the depth of what we're looking at in the book based off the size, but we're going to try to take it a book at a week uh, and, and, and move at, at that speed. So what I want you to think about for your goal, and you'll see even there on the handout there, if you can, if you're, if you're a notes person and you're going to use this to keep track of how we're going through these classes, then I would even right now think and write a goal for yourself uh, on that blank right there. Uh, mostly so that you can look back at the end of April or beginning of May when we finish this class, and you can look at what your goal was and, and kind of assess how you did in, in meeting that goal. And that's not so that we're checking a box and, and super goal-oriented, but it's just that you can see what you've learned. 
Uh, and, and maybe you have just a desire to read all the Minor Prophets. And if that's your goal, then you can check that box at the end if you, if you go through and read the Minor Prophets. And you'll have a greater understanding of Scripture. So write a goal for yourself. Uh, the next thing that we see there is the assignments, which I'm sure you guys were not expecting. No, it's, just, it's mostly a joke. Um, the assignments, what we want you guys to do is to study the Bible with us. So if you show up and you haven't read anything on Wednesday night, that's okay. Uh, you're only going to get out as much as you put in, in that sense. That you're just going to get out what you get in on Wednesday night. Um, but if you uh, read uh, the minor prophet that we're studying for that next week, during the week, you'll get a lot more out of Wednesday night because you'll understand already some of the things that we're talking about and seeing. Um, so I, I would encourage you uh, each week, so for next week we're reading Obadiah, we're studying Obadiah in the class, read Obadiah this coming week. Uh, Obadiah is one chapter, so maybe read it like four or five times. Um, make, uh, make yourself a, a schedule, in your, or time in your schedule, so that you have time to read these. Maybe even take notes, or write down questions that you have, or things that you're noticing, like repeated words, or unusual sayings or something like that. And then you can ask Rick those questions <laughs> on the weeks that he teaches. <laughs> um, yeah, but even just a highlighter, frankly. I mean, just making note of things that you're trying to study. And lastly, uh, if you notice, there's a lot of other people in this room. Uh, maybe they're all studying the same thing. Well, actually they are, right? Because they're all in the same class. So you can find somebody else in this room, even, and have an accountability partner to be like, hey, just text me on Friday and see if I've read Obadiah or not. Maybe build a relationship with somebody you don't know here at Grace that way. And you can have somebody to talk to about it. You can have somebody to, to bounce off uh, questions. Even just somebody to remind you to read is a helpful thing. And so there's plenty of people in the room. I'm sure plenty of people would like that. So maybe after class, ask somebody. Uh, lastly... We are going to do three memory verses over the course of 16, 15, 16 weeks. So hopefully that's, that's not too demanding for you. I think it's fun as a class to memorize scripture. Uh, and doing three, is, it will be a, a, a way to be equipped but not overwhelmed. And so we're going to start out next week and we'll hand out memory verse cards. And or it's not going to be like a whole chapter or something. But if you wanted to memorize a whole book of the Bible, Obadiah is the one. <laughs> okay. So, we're going to start there with that first question. What is the context for the Minor Prophets? And to, to set the context for you, I mean, really you have to, to read all of, the, all of the Bible going up to the Minor Prophets to get kind of the historical, at least the historical books, that, to set the historical stage. And we don't have time to do that. So I'm going to try to do this, this 10 minute flyover, and hopefully I don't crash the plane, a 10 minute flyover of the history of Israel and, and the events leading up to the Minor Prophets. And hopefully that will help us have a better perspective of what we're getting into. Um, because what we'll see in the Minor Prophets uh, is that there's a lot of history referenced, there's a lot of history that's being discussed, and there's a lot of things that are promised that we will see in history. And so the context really matters for the Minor Prophets. Um, each book is placed in, in such a way in history that you can look at promises that were made in the later, earlier in the Old Testament and see that they're met there and fulfilled there. You can see promises made in that book that are fulfilled later in a later minor prophet book. And you can see promises that are made there that are going to be fulfilled way, way in the future. Um, even as we're talking about in our sermons on the past few Sundays. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, it's, if you guys want to keep track on your paper, this is the one page that bleeds over to the next page. So if you feel like that's not a lot of room to write the whole history of Israel, you're right, you have another half page. <laughs> All right, so at the beginning, creation, God created man. There was a perfect relationship between God and man. Uh, image bearers, man was to be an image bearer of God, uh, representing God to all creation. Uh, God spoke to man in, the, in a way that, um, that there showed that there was an intimate relationship there um, between God and, and, and man. The fall happens. Um, Adam and Eve fall into sin. They disobey God's word. And that breaks the relationship. And so right there at the very beginning uh, in Genesis 3, we see kind of a, a little snapshot of, of what we're going to see all throughout Scripture 
in that there's judgment and, and salvation. There's a, there's a judgment, there's a curse of sin that is placed on all creation uh, and, and the effects that we all feel today. Um, we are sinners because of that. And there's a promise of salvation. There's salvation in this promised seed uh, who will one day kind of undo what has happened there in the fall and make things right again. And so that happens in Genesis 3. Uh, we have Noah and the flood next, kind of in our, in our timeline we're talking through here. Uh, there's abundant sin across the face of the world. Judgment was, was given out by God. God destroyed, wiped out, uh, wiped out most of everything on the earth, except for Noah and his family. Uh, and salvation is given to Noah and his family. We see this, this promise then in Genesis 3. We see like it's even being preserved in the, in the saving of Noah and his family. Like This promise is still alive. There's still hope. And we have a covenant between God and man. We have a covenant with, with uh, Noah there that God will never again flood the earth in that way. And so this is even a type of seeing like God makes these covenants. God makes these promises uh, in his word. Next, we have Abraham. He's called by God to, uh, to leave his, his family and to go to the land that God has set before him. He responds in faith. God's covenant with Abraham uh, is land. There's a promise of land that is given. He's going to have many descendants. And that the whole world will be blessed through him. And God guarantees that covenant himself. And so we see this, this big picture is getting zoomed in, right, on this one person, this one family. And all these promises and, and patterns that we're seeing are, are starting to be uh, focused in on in this family. And so following Abraham's family, we're looking for this promised seed. We're, we're asking, who is it going to be? Who's going to be the one? Um, God is making a relationship between God and man. Uh, again, uh, he's, he's chosen Abraham uh, and, and his descendants to be a, a people for himself. Uh, you have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the promises are repeated to them. The blessings are repeated to them. They're maybe clarified uh, in specific ways. Then we have the 12 tribes, uh, the sons of Jacob, and they uh, show how, even quickly how God's promise to Abraham is being fulfilled, and that he's having a lot more descendants, right? It was one, and then, and then a few, and then, boom, lots of them. Uh, and so we have the 12 tribes. Uh, they go down to Egypt, and eventually they're enslaved in Egypt, and they cry out for salvation. God appoints uh, a, a man, Moses, to, to be his voice to the people, to represent himself before Pharaoh. Uh, and in, now I'm giving you your first date there. Uh, we're going to have a few dates. 1445, roughly, is how we're thinking about this, as the exodus um, from Egypt. So 14. 1445. Now, if in the later weeks of this class, I need to go back and say I was wrong, I reserve that right. <laughs> because t I, there will be times where I will have to say that, I'm sure. Um, so, Exodus is a really important, uh, the Exodus from Egypt is a really important picture in Scripture that we have. It's God's salvation of his people, calling out a people to himself to follow him. There's judgment on the Egyptians. Um, but these people, or these Israelites, are called out to be a people of God. There's now this idea of nation. There's a nation of Israel. And there's Moses and this Mosaic covenant that God gives between himself and the people. And that covenant revolves around the things that the covenant uh, previously had, had revolved around with Abraham. You have land. You have this uh, promise of blessing. Um, you have a promise of descendants even in that land. Um, but very importantly, we have the law that comes out of this um, interaction in this time in Scripture. We have the law, and the law sets God's people apart. It's very core um, distinction and how the people of God are sp supposed to behave um, with themselves, uh, with their authorities, with God himself, um, <clears throat> with everything in life. And the purpose of that is to set them apart so that they would be a distinct and, and separate people and represent God to the world even. Uh, God's presence is dwelling with his people. So we have the tabernacle. It's in the middle of the, of the, of the camp of Israel. God's presence is directly there. And we have this, this introduction of, of a system uh, of sacrifices. And we even had an idea of what that might look like um, with Abraham and Isaac earlier in Genesis. 
But we have this sacrifice system that shows how an unholy people can dwell in the presence of a holy God. It's, it's how there can be a relationship with God. It's a way to deal with sin. But even as it's happening, even as you see the Day of Atonement in Leviticus, it's clear like this is going to be this re- repetitive thing that's going to keep having to happen. And clearly, like this can't be the final, ultimate uh, way for people to have a relationship with God. And so as we see going forward in the Old Testament, we have the cycle of Israel. Israel follows God, uh, then they turn from God to idols and to sin, and they, they fall away. God brings judgment on their sin and calls them back to return. And that just this repeats over and over and over again. Uh, they repent, they turn back to God, and we just see this cycle, this cycle happening. Um, and we're going to see that cycle even in the Minor Prophets uh, as, we, as we get there. Um, but as we are looking there in the Old Testament, we, we see that they're, they're in the land now. There's judges that, that are supposed to be the leaders of Israel. You're looking, like, is one of these guys going to be the promised seed? Like, no, they keep failing, and some of them fail in very spectacular ways. There's wickedness. Everything's not looking good. They ask, well, maybe a king will work. And so the first king of Israel, they set up, and boom, that does not go well. Uh, the first one's a flop, so maybe, maybe it's a different king. Uh, and so we have David. And David's a man after God's own heart. Um, he uh, is king starting from around 1010 B.C. And he's a man after God's own heart. Um, God makes a covenant with him uh, that he will have from his line a king, the Davidic king, the, the ultimate king that is going to kind of make things better and right and represent God in a way that, that David sees as like, this is really special, uh, as he writes in the Psalms. But we also know this about David. David wasn't the ultimate promised seed, and David fil- fails big time. Uh, he falls into sin. Uh, and there's judgment because of that. Solomon is David's son. He builds the temple. Uh, he's really wise. He, he writes a lot of scripture. Uh, but he also falls into great sin. And so because of his sin, the unified kingdom of Israel is divided in 931 B.C. And starting there is where we're going to start having things happen um, in our minor prophet context. We have a, a north kingdom and a south kingdom. The north kingdom is uh, the, the ten tribes to the north. They almost, all the kings are bad, all the people are bad, there's a lot of wickedness, uh, there's judgment, uh, there's an exile that's prophesied, saying, hey, you're going to get taken out of here if you don't repent and turn back to God. They don't. And so in 722 B.C., uh, the northern kingdom is carried off uh, into exile, and never, never uh, they don't return, there's never a, a, a northern kingdom again. The southern kingdom, on the other hand, um, had bad kings and good kings. And uh, just like the, the northern kingdom, they had prophets that, that went to them. They called them to, to turn back to God. They bring God's word. Um, they're often, they, they do listen. Uh, and so there are good kings. Uh, but ultimately, there's still uh, a, a sin problem in, in their hearts. And so God tells them that he, there's going to be an exile um, and so starting in 605 is when Daniel's carried off. Uh, there's an exile um, of, of the Jewish people that were there uh, in Judea. And by 586, uh, 586 is the date that Jerusalem and the temple are fu- fully destroyed. And everyone's exiled. What date did you say it was? 586. Uh, the return happens uh, in, in, a, in a few... Uh, like 50 years after that, uh, and so we're talking about this this time. Um, we're gonna, actually we're going to talk about that in the Minor Prophets, but the temple is rebuilt in 516, um, and so that's that's a notable date as well for the Southern Kingdom. But even as that temple is rebu- rebuilt, um, the the men right? You, you, I think you guys will remember this in Scripture. The men who, who remember the old temple and are seeing this, they're, they're seeing that this is not the same. The glory's the glory's lost, uh, and so this northern kingdom, southern kingdom, times of exile, rebuilding the temple, uh, that is the context of the minor prophets. And so the minor prophets cover about 300 years of history. 
Uh, I will list all the minor prophets right now in chronological order, which is also on your schedule right there. So if you want to look at it there, we have Obadiah, we have Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So these 12 books uh, by 12 prophets, they're called minor, but they're not minor in stature. They're not like these are the less important prophets to, to study. Like, you need to understand the major ones, the minor ones, and eh, it's okay. No, they're just minor in terms of length. Minor in terms of length. And actually, in the, the Hebrew Bible, they're called the Book of the Twelve, and they're all together. And you kind of have the, you have the major prophets there, and then you have the Book of the Twelve. And there's kind of like this idea that there's this, the, they carry the same weight. Um, and so, actually, even in, in your reading about this, if you've done any already, and if you do any as we go through the class, you're going to see them referenced as the Book of the Twelve frequently. So, Obadiah was written in about 84, uh, 845 B.C., so he's the first minor prophet. We're going to study him and what he wrote next week. And Malachi which is the final minor prophet and kind of closes the canon of the Old Testament was written in 430 B.C. And so as we go through the minor prophets, we'll talk about the context and, and who they are and, and what history is going on. Um, some of them speak to the northern kingdom. Uh, some of them speak to Judah before the exile, and some of them speak to Judah after the exile. Uh, they repeat the ideas, and so that's kind of even why we've done this flyover of the history of, of Israel in the Old Testament. They repeat the ideas that we've already seen in the Bible uh, up, to the, up to the point of the Minor Prophets. And so that idea of judgment and salvation is there in the Minor Prophets, the idea of the land and the, and the promises of the land is there. The Davidic kingship is there. So this idea of looking towards this, this promised seed and, and resolving this, this sin problem that we have. God's promises are repeated in the Minor Prophets. Uh, repentance and restoration are, are a big thing, a, a big theme in the Minor Prophets as well. And so as, as you guys read the Minor Prophets as, and as we teach them, but as you read them, uh, especially in the weeks between classes, look for those things and, and ask yourself, how is this fitting in with the story of Israel, the history of Israel? Uh, why, why is this in the Bible? I think that's a good question to ask as we read any part of Scripture. Is why, why is this in the Bible? Why does God want us to read this? And why is it here? Why is it in this context? Okay, so that is a brief uh, answer to the question, what is the context for the minor prophets? The next question that we have that we're going to answer is how do we study the minor prophets? And news alert, there is no magic formula. So if you thought that showing up at a Wednesday night class, you could just download all of the information in the minor prophets into your brain, like that's just... Not how it works. Otherwise, I would go to that class too. So what, what we do then, uh, what is required of us is that we actually have to do the work. We have to study it. Uh, it requires work uh, to understand the minor prophets. So think of this in terms of even as how you do your devotions and, and how you study God's word. Like there's, a, there's an element of work that, that goes into that. Uh, it's not... That you can just open the page and it just downloads into your face. Like you have to study it, you have to ask questions, you have to read things, you have to cross, maybe even look at a cross reference and try to understand like how the pieces fit together. Uh, so what this means for you guys is that it's going to require a little bit of your time. It's going to require your love for God and a commitment uh, to to do the work to understand the minor prophets. So if somebody were to ask me like how do I study like that. That's the first answer I would give. Is like It's going to require you to work at it, to, to try and look at it. Uh, I can't just give you a YouTube link to watch that and it explains everything. You're going to have to do the work. And so, kind of, I said this at the beginning, you'll get out of it as much as you put into it. So if you're, you're diligent into, into how you read it, even during the week before the class, you'll get a lot out of the class. Uh, you just show up at the class, you'll still get stuff out of the class, but you'll get more out of it if you read the week bef read beforehand uh, what we're studying. Um, and again, there's, there's not going to be immediate results. 
So if you read Obadiah tomorrow morning, there's not going to be an immediate understanding of Obadiah. Um, there's not going to even be an immediate understanding on, on Monday. If you read it every day between now and Monday, there might be more understanding. Um, there's not going to be immediate understanding even in two or three weeks. But I guarantee you that if you are, are faithful in studying God's word, starting today for, for the Minor Prophets class, at 15 weeks from now, you'll be able to look back and go, oh, I, I did learn some stuff. I, I do see how God's uh, word fits together better. Uh, so I think it's helpful to have this perspective of, of looking at the, the, the big race and seeing that it's not just about the first few steps. It's, it's about getting to the finish line looking back and seeing uh, what you did. So that requires endurance, requires some hard work. So let's answer that question then. How do we study the minor prophets? And really this is how we're going to teach the minor prophets to you guys and how you all should study and read it on your own. It's, this, it's the same thing. So when we get to the minor prophets, we don't suddenly try to interpret scripture differently. So we read and understand the minor prophets just like we read and understand any other book in the Bible. So there's not a special minor prophet formula that we're going to apply. It's, it's the same way we try to interpret all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And so a simple acronym then of how this works is OIA, Observation, Interpretation, Application. And it's really simple, and that's wonderful, because it, it really truly is simple. God's word is meant to be understood and, and read. It's not meant to be confusing and unknowable. And so what, what's that first letter there? It's O, observation. So you, that's, that's just observing what's there in front of you. That's reading the text, uh, not just once or, or twice, but maybe many times. It's asking questions about what is there. It's noticing details and places and names, repeated words, confusing sayings. It's noting, like, oh, these are commands here, and these are questions over here, things like that. That's, that's observing the text. Um, and if you want, um, you can come up and after your class, there's, there's many resources on how to do this. There's many resources even on like, here's a list of questions to ask yourself as you go through a passage, um, just on getting observations of what's there. And so we observe. Uh, second, there is the, is the I. We interpret, interpretation. What does it mean, in, in other words? Uh, and this is actually what's going to be the most difficult part in the Minor Prophets, and I'm sure... Uh, you already share that sentiment. Uh, what does it mean? How do we figure it out? How do we figure out what the correct interpretation is? But you can see, like, oh, there's a couple different interpretations. How do we know it's the right one? So you might have heard the word hermeneutic before. That's a big word. Um, if you don't know what it means, it just means it's like how you study Scripture. What's, the, what's your methodology for understanding what Scripture means? What rules do you use? And that's a very big conversation. Uh, there's a lot of very smart people that have very smart conversations about that kind of stuff. Um, but we're just going to keep it simple and, and look at the way we interpret Scripture here at Grace Bible Church, uh, which means that we have a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. We, we, this is how we understand Scripture. These are the rules that we use. And don't panic. Right? It's, not, it's not complicated. We'll go through each, each step there. Um, literal, first... This fundamentally means, what did the author mean when he wrote it? What, what was the author's meaning in that text? What's the intention there? We want to take the author at face value with his words and work from there. So that means that we don't want to unnecessarily spiritualize the text and deny its his historical and literal meaning. Uh, another way to think about this is your meaning of the text and, and looking at it can't mean something that the author never meant it to mean. Right? It has to mean what the author meant it to mean. And so I can give you an example. So if you guys turn to Jonah, chapter 1. Jonah's a minor prophet, by the way. We'll get to him. But Rick chose Jonah because Jonah's easy to teach. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> No, just kidding. Okay, so Jonah, we're going to be at the end of chapter 1. In the context of Jonah, 
hopefully is, is familiar to, to you all. Uh, he's on the boat, and they're like, who are you? Like, tell us who you are and what is happening to us. And he, and he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid to him and said, what is this you have done? For they knew what he was talking about. They believed him. They're like, yeah, you are running from God. This is all happening to us. This is really crazy and scary. What do we need to do? And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, this is where we're going to get to this part about a literal interpretation. Like, what did the author mean? So look there at verse 17. They, they throw him into the sea, and, and immediately everything stops. In verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, if we're going to try to understand what the author means, then as we read, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, what do we think that means? Like, the, like a great fish swallowed up Jonah, right? Like that's what we... But if we were to interpret this in a, in a not literal way and try to like make it make sense and like, like fish don't do that, like that's crazy. Um, so maybe this is a spiritual thing and like there was this this boat that was called the Great Fish, and, and that was the they, they and they grabbed Jonah out of the ocean and they carried him and put him below deck for three days. Maybe we can explain it in a different way. Maybe it's all spiritual. And he never actually left the boat, but he just kind of entered into this coma, and we call it the, the Great Fish. And like yeah, if you start doing things that that break the rules of, of understanding scripture in a, in a literal way, in a way of what did the author mean, then you end up in a place where you get to make up your own meaning of Scripture. And we're sinful. And so when we add our own meaning and make up our own meaning, then we're going to go in a way that God doesn't want us to go. So we need to, to start out by trying to understand and read the text from a normal reading and work from there. Uh, you might go, but wait, there are figures of speech. And if you understand that in a literal way, then you're going to end up in a weird place too. And I agree. Like, if you have a heart of stone, literally, Right? You're going to die. Cause... <laughs> but guess what? If you have a heart of stone, you are going to die. Yeah, in, in, in a very bad way for judgment. But yeah, you can't have a heart of stone, literally, right? In, in a physical sense. And so we can't be too wooden. We can't force it. I mean, it has to be literal every single time. Uh, we have to understand that there's figures of speech and idioms and, and metaphors that the prophets even use to explain things in a sp specific way. But simply put, our, our question must be when we're reading any text, and for you, it's reading the Minor Prophets, what did the author mean? So that's literal. Grammatical. Now, I'm sure some of you don't want to hear the word grammar. Uh, you probably spent the better part of your life running from grammar. And if you're here, you're probably safe. You made it. Uh, but I'm springing it on you again. Uh, simply put, the, the biblical authors, the prophets in our case, use normal rules of language to communicate and to write the Bible. So we have to use normal rules of language and grammar to read the Bible. There's not a special Bible grammar that helps you understand the Bible in, in some ways where like, things all of a sudden have different meanings. Like, no, it, it is meant to be used uh, using normal language. That's the way we're meant to understand it. And so that means that there's verbs and nouns and adjectives and conjunctions and Bible authors use all of those parts of speech to communicate. You don't need to understand all the parts of speech to understand uh, how to read the Bible exactly. But if you start getting into a place where you're like, I really, I'm struggling, like what does this mean? Well, it might be things that you're just missing in the grammar. Um, maybe you need to know what a conjunction is, and like how, how things are connected or if I say, I like this, uh, and I like this, that, that's a connecting thing, but I say, I like this, but I don't like that. Like, there, there's a conjunction. There's a difference between and and but, right? Uh, if you have, a, have ors, like, I will do this, or I will do that. That means you can't do both, right? That's, and that's just grammar. Like, that's just how we use our words. Um, and so when you do your study in the Minor Prophets, look for those things, like conjunction, conjunctions and connecting words and and words that are meaning for comparison and negations, things like that. You don't have to be a grammar expert, 
but that just means you can't ignore grammar in your interpretation. All right, lastly, how do we interpret the Bible better? How do we understand it? What does it mean? We have to look at the, the historical context, the historical background. There is a background and a context and a culture in every passage of Scripture. This is true throughout the whole Bible. So that means that we can't impose our own understanding and context and culture onto Scripture. We're going to read some stuff in the Minor Prophets, and that's just going to go like, what did I just read? Like, that is crazy and weird and even maybe like embarrassing or awkward. But we have to understand that there, there's a different culture that's going on for that text. And when the original author wrote it to his original audience, they understood that culture and they understood what the author was trying to say. We're 2,000, maybe even like, like almost 3,000 years removed from this culture and context. Uh, and, and frankly, it, it can be confusing. So that's why we have things like study Bibles and commentaries and things that can help in dictionaries even to help us understand what's going on. Uh, the Minor Prophets, and we're going to talk about this a lot as we go through some of them in particular, but there's a whole c uh, concept of geography and place names that are very, very key in understanding what's going on. And if you don't know uh, what's one place from another and why that place is really bad, but this place is really good, like you're, you're just, you will get lost, frankly. And so some things are referenced as just by the place name, and you're supposed to just know that means bad. But if you don't know anything about those names, then you're not going to know that. So there's a context to what we're working with. Um, another funny example that's kind of almost too silly, uh, go to John 12, 1 through 3. This is New Testament, so it's not Minor Prophets exactly. But it, it can help us understand this idea of, of background and culture. Now, I, I know you guys are probably more familiar with John uh, and the Gospels. And so what's happening here, it's, um, well, I'll just read it. John 12, 1 through 3. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, if we were going to impose our own culture and context on this passage, if I were to do that, I would say, that's really weird and gross. Like, I don't want whoever's hosting me to just come out and start washing my feet with their hair. Like, please, I'm good. No thanks. Um, and so if we're to read that and apply that interpretation and understanding, and like, what, so what does it mean? Um, like, Jesus is trying to eat dinner. Mary came in and started acting weird. What can we learn from that? Don't act weird at dinner. That's my interpretation. Like, no, that's, that's, that's wrong, right? It, that's, that's me putting my understanding of what's good and right and normal and, and, and placing that in a context where that's not the same. So the historical background and culture of, of the setting of John 12 tells us that what Mary did is one of the most self-humbling things, of uh, uh, actions of devotion that you could do, and it showed her love for her Savior, and it was at great cost to herself even. So if we ignore the historical context, we miss that. And that's going to be very true for us in the Minor Prophets. So I don't know if you have a study Bible or, or access to study Bible notes, but some of those notes are really, really helpful. Um, sometimes there's maps um, or there's charts that say, that's who this guy is. He was over here, and he did that bad thing, and that's why they said his name, because that means a bad thing is going to happen. Uh, things like that are really helpful. Uh, there's cross-references, too. And frankly, I would, if you have time... I would lean on those and go like, why is this being referenced? And you go all the way back to Genesis or Judges or some other place in the Bible and you see like, oh, so there's a context to what, what even this is being referenced in Scripture. So, so how do we interpret the Bible? Well, we, we look at what the author means. Uh, we put that as a priority. We see what the grammar is saying in just plain language. And we look at the history and the context of the passage. All right, so that's our O and our I. Our A is that we apply the texts. There's application. And so that's true for this class even. This class is not just for head knowledge. 
Uh, it's not just um, so that we can say that we know more about the minor prophets than you do. Um, no, this, this class is for our hearts. Scripture's for our hearts and not just our heads. And so we're going to try to apply what we learn about God, uh, what we learn about ourselves, what we learn about the world around us and our everyday life. We're going to apply that. And you can apply the minor prophets just as well as you can apply Genesis or John or Ephesians. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult to try to find the application, uh, but it's there. And so I can just give you an example uh, from the whole book of Joel. Uh, and Joel, one of the themes is this idea of the nations, uh, uh, the nations of the world. And so one of the, the right interpretations of, the, of that text then, of the whole text of Joel, is that there's a, God has a plan for salvation that's beyond just Israel. It's for the whole world. Uh, how do we apply that to our day-to-day -day life is the question then, right? How do we apply that? And so that, that means that we need to understand that, right, what, what is, the, how does the whole world get saved? What is that, that through? It's through the gospel. And so we need to understand that the gospel then is, is part of even like this idea of understanding Joel and how we could apply it to our lives. You're part of God's plan to reach the world with the gospel. You need to be sharing the gospel. So one application is to go out of your way to share the gospel tomorrow. That's applying what you're learning in Joel and God's plan for the salvation. You're taking part of God's mission uh, to the world. So that's observing, interpreting, and applying Joel, like a whole book. So we can do that as we go through the Minor Prophets. Um, and I'm going to repeat that again when I teach Joel. So a news alert there. All right. So this week, as you read Obadiah, do this process. Observe what's going in there. Ask, ask questions, highlight, make notes, look up things. Uh, if you can't do all of that, just, just read Joel or put it on the audio Bible and listen to all the weird names that get read. Um, interpret as best as you can. And think even about applications, even as you come into class next Wednesday. Um, and we can talk about that then. And that's, that's the hard work of studying Scripture. And it's a blessing. And I, and I trust that you will be blessed by doing that work, by studying Scripture in that way. All right. So now... To our final question. Nope, sorry, it's not our final question. <laughs> that is confusing for me, too. Like, we are not at the final question yet. So what will we see in the Minor Prophets? What will we see in the Minor Prophets? Part of the benefit of knowing other parts of your Bible is that you'll see that the Bible uh, is connected together. It, it, it builds on itself. It's progressive in, in re its revelation. And so what we're going to do as we study the Minor Prophets is we're going to study them in the chronological order of which they are written, which isn't the same order that's in your English Bible. Um, and that's okay. It doesn't have to, they're not saying anything that's bad with your English Bible at all. The whole point of studying them in chronological order is to see how they connect and build on each other. You'll see that there's a promise made here, or a prophecy of judgment made here. And then in this book, you see that that is being fulfilled right now. And then this book talks about how that promise was fulfilled there. And we can see that better if we go through them in chronological order. Um, so we're going to see how they connect in that way. We're going to see uh, how they build on each other and reference other scripture. Um, the Bible is full of references uh, to past events. And, and uses even types of language that, that should tell you that you should be thinking about a past event. Um, we do this also in, in our everyday life. Um, now, right, if we were to reference 2020, like, oh, that's just like 2020. Like, what, what, what weight does that bring? It's like, well, a lot of bad things happened in 2020. We didn't like 2020. Like, 2020 was stressful, whatever. Like, there's this, there's this understanding in our culture of what 2020 means now. In 2019, we had no such understanding of 2020. It wasn't until after 2020 that we, this idea of this year all of a sudden has this whole I, greater meaning, right? Well, the Bible works that way, too. Like, until you have an exodus, you can't talk about an idea of exodus and, and being called out. But after the exodus, you can. Uh, before you had uh, a judgment, like the whole flood in Noah, you can't talk about things in that context, in that kind of similar language. But now that you had it in Noah, when you get to Habakkuk, you can use that type of language, and you can see in Habakkuk, like, oh, that's, 
That's a widespread destruction and judgment. I understand what that means because of what I saw in Noah. This is what we're going to see in the minor prophets. That's how they build on each other. Uh, even, like, even the types of judgment that you have in the Old Testament, like plagues uh, in Egypt, that idea of judgment, you can just mention that and then you have a greater understanding of the judgment in the minor prophets. So, we're going to study them in a chronological way. We're going to see that they build on each other and connect uh, in that way. And they even show us how the Old Testament can get connected to the New Testament and how these promises carry right over. And when you have John the Baptist, he's like the final guy of the, of the minor prophets, the final guy that's, that's representing what was before and preaching of this good news and that you should be looking for the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world now. Like that's what John the Baptist did. He's building on everything that came before. So we're going to look at them, look at them in the chronological order. We're going to see different types of scripture. Um, we'll discuss the, them as we get to them. Uh, but just to, to list a couple for you, we're going to see Hebrew poetry. Um, Hebrew, Hebrew poetry is, is different than English poetry. Um, not only because it's a different language and written thousands of years ago, but also there's just different things in there that mean different things. There's repetition and, and parallelism and things like that. Now, we'll talk about it as we get to it, but you should notice that. And, and, and most Bibles do a good job of setting apart the text and showing you, like, you're reading poetry now. This is different. We're going to see narrative. Not everywhere, but we will see it. Uh, Jonah's a great example of narrative. And that's just a... a a running text and story uh, of, what's, of what's going on. Uh, we're going to see apocalyptic writing. And that's talking about future events and future judgment and, and things that might seem intense. And you might recognize that we're even talking about some of that even in Matthew uh, in our sermons on Sunday. But especially, and because of prophets, after all, we're going to see prophecy. I see a lot of prophecy. And we need to understand a little bit about prophecy and how, how we should think about, like when you read something that's being prophesied, how you should think about it. Now, there's, there's fulfilled prophecies that happen during the course of the Minor Prophets. Uh, great examples of that are like judgments of like whole nations and peoples and cities that are going to get wiped off the earth and whatever, however many years later they do. And you can say, like, oh, that was fulfilled there. Um, the problem or difficulty is that we will see that some of these prophecies are made, like, one after the other, and you see, like, well, that prophecy was clearly fulfilled there. How is this prophecy fulfilled? Like, I don't even see where that could happen. And so we have to understand that the prophets, as they're writing these prophecies and, and, and even telling them to the people, they don't even always know exactly where and how it's going to get fulfilled. Um, and so and I can give you an example of this. Um, if we are all facing that way, and we see two mountain peaks, and we can be like, those are our two prophecies that, we are, that we're writing here and, and telling. Over here, we don't know how far apart those mountain peaks are. We just can see two of them. But if you walk around and go really far that way, you might see like, oh, we have a mountain here and a mountain way over here. Over here, they look like they're lined up, but over here, we can see there's this space and time. Well, the, the, the prophets didn't always see the space and time, but they did see the two prophecies. And a great example of this is the day of the Lord. And this is going to be a phrase that we're going to see all over the minor prophets. The day of the Lord is, is a day of judgment and salvation. Right? There's Sin is judged, and people are saved. There's a restoration and repentance, and judgment and condemnation. That phrase references, at times, judgment for the people in that context, in that near time, right? This, this, this current time and context of the minor prophets. And they could say, day of the Lord is going to happen. You're going to get wiped off the face of the earth. And that happens. And then you can have a, a promise and prophecy about the day of the Lord and what it's going to look like. And you're going to go, like, what? What happens to all of the, the, the moon and the stars? Like, what's going on? That, did that happen then? No, it's like it's this mountain peak idea where it's like you have a day of the Lord thing here and you have the day of the Lord as in the final day of judgment uh, over all, uh, all creation of all time. And so you have these things put 
next to each other. And so we have to understand and think about it as we go through, like, when and where is this prophecy being fulfilled? How, how is it working? So as you go through, try to understand uh, and, and think through prophecy that way. Note it. Um, the, the really big ones, right, we're going to talk about in class as we go through that book. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll talk more about prophecy as we go through the class. Okay, themes. Themes in the Minor Prophets. And again, we're going to talk about these. We'll discuss them as they happen and, and arise. Um, but you'll notice that these are they're picking up on stuff that's already in Scripture, and it's going to continue stuff that's, that's already in Scripture. And so hopefully that gives you a confidence in, in even reading the Minor Prophets for yourself. This is not some unusual, crazy thing in the Bible that you should be afraid of and where your daily Bible reading plan dies. Like, no, the Minor Prophets... You don't need to be afraid of them. You're, it's, it's the same scripture, and it's working with all of scripture. So we see uh, judgment a lot in the Minor Prophets. And in fact, we could probably characterize the Minor Prophets by their talk of judgment. We also see a lot of salvation promised. And these often work together, uh, this, this idea and theme of judgment, this theme of salvation. We see restoration as well. Restoration as promises, uh, restorations as, as like referencing to what's already happened and what it should look like in the future. Uh, restoration to the land, restoration of people, restoration of nations. We see repentance as well. In fact, we learn a lot about repentance in uh, the Minor Prophets. We see land land as well, the, the, the talking specifically about the land of Israel, but also talking about the land around Israel and the different nations that are represented by that, those lands. And just even looking at that, we know like this is not unusual. Like, this has already been talked about in, in the Bible. We see references to the Davidic king, to, to the one who's coming that is going to be able to make things right. They don't always even know exactly how and where and when that will happen, but they are talking about it and writing about it. And then lastly, a major theme that we'll see is the day of the Lord, that idea of, of judgment, salvation all at once, uh, this end time uh, teaching. And that's, that's all throughout the Minor Prophets as well. Okay. So, and again, as you read through them, be looking for those themes. We'll be talking about those themes as well. All right. Now we're at the last question. Why should we study the Minor Prophets? Why should we study the Minor Prophets? Well, first, all Scripture is inspired... All scripture is God-breathed. I know many of you know this verse by heart. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So when that scripture was written, even, they, they predominantly had the Old Testament. So Paul is saying, look, all of this is useful for you guys. You guys need this. It means he was talking about the Minor Prophets. Of course, this applies to all Scripture, but it also applies to the Minor Prophets, um, just as much as it applies to, to Matthew or the Psalms or Leviticus. And so, because of that, uh, we should know that the, that the Minor Prophets are profitable for us. They teach us. They teach us things that we need to know. They teach us uh, things about God. They teach us things about ourselves. They teach us about God's plan, about sin. They discipline us. They help us um, be stronger in our faith and our walk. They correct us, so they help us see our sin in a very clear way. And I'm sure there were, there's going to be very, hopefully there's going to be very many times when you're reading the, old, the Minor Prophets and you see the judgments that are pronounced on people for doing certain things. And you can see, like, oh, I am also that person, and I do those things. 
Like, how merciful is it for God to save me? I need to repent of my sin. Uh, that, hopefully that, that is there for you as you read through them. They train us for righteousness so that we can serve and love God with everything that we have. So, one reason why is just that it's God's word. Uh, the minor prophets are God's word. All right, two. Uh, hopefully I didn't confuse you guys on number one. <laughs> <laughs> that was all five, right? No, that, that, was, that was one. <laughs> one A, B, C. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did start with one. To be fair, I did say one, and then I didn't say two yet. All right. You did add a bunch of and thens after I that. did go and then. That's clear. That's true. I use conjunctions. To connect, yeah. All right, number two. Why should we study the minor prophets? Because they are the, uh, the epistles of the Old Testament. And that wasn't me. That was Dr. Abner Chow who said that, but I thought it was really smart. So I stole it. They teach us doctrine and theology. We learn about God's love. We learn about God's plan for the future. We learn about uh, God's word. We learn about God's promises. We learn doctrine in the Minor Prophets. Now, they're not necessarily as didactic and in teaching as the epistles in the New Testament. Um, and frankly, it's because it's a different culture and context even in how it, they're um, being taught to us. But they do teach us doctrine. We learn about God. We learn about sin. They, we learn answers to questions that arise in life in the Minor Prophets. Three, <laughs> why should we study the Minor Prophets? Because the Minor Prophets help us understand the whole Bible better. Hopefully that's something that you're hearing repeated tonight. They help us understand progressive revelation. So if you just you have the Old Testament, you ignore the Minor Prophets, and you jump into the New Testament, you're missing pieces that are connecting. You're missing pieces of the puzzle that go in between. So we, we need the Minor Prophets to help us understand the whole Bible. Uh, the Minor Prophets are used by the later writers of Scripture to build upon what God has already promised in his word. They're referenced and quoted in the, in the New Testament. The New Testament, right, uh, in, even in some of the sermons in the New Testament that are recorded, they use the Minor Prophets to teach us. Uh, so we need to understand what's going on there um, so that we can understand our Bible. Now, it doesn't necessarily help us always understand. Like, so an example of this is Joel in, in Acts. Joel is, is used by Peter in, in his opening sermon in Acts. Um, and so it actually it causes us to ask questions. Like, how should we understand uh, Joel based off how Peter teaches Joel? And as we get to Joel, we'll, we'll learn some of that. Uh, understanding other minor prophets help us understand different concepts and, and word pictures that are used in the New Testament. All right, number four. Why should we study the Minor Prophets? Because we can find joy in reading and learning about God's promises for the future. So these books, as well as we're seeing in Matthew, as you can see in the promises made in the New Testament for the future, these books reveal God's plan and promises. We see prophecies made. We see prophecies kept. <coughs> Um, and that should give us something. It should give us a confidence in God's other promises that he's already made to us. Uh, it's, it's really comforting to see that God keeps his word uh, in the Minor Prophets, so we can know that God's going to keep his word in the future. Uh, we need to find joy in reading about God's promises. Now, that might be a, a concept that you don't always have. Like, I don't, I'm just confused. How am I joyful? It's just, I don't even understand what's going on. But joy is, is forward-looking. It's Understanding that there's going to be an ending to, to God's plan. So that plan that starts all the way in Genesis, Genesis 1, Genesis 3, and the promises that are made. There's going to be an ending to that, like a real ending. It's not this metaphorical, spiritual, like, well, let's, let's just think about how it could. Like, no, like, there's a real ending, and God tells us what it's going to look like and what's going to happen. Um, and so that should give us a joy in that we know that God has, has the best ending uh, for us and that we get to be with him for all eternity. Um, should find joy in, in, in that there's going to be a real physical ending. It's not just this just kind of always constant struggle with sin. That the sin will be removed for all, all time. 
Now, in that, so this is still under four, <laughs> uh, I think there will be times, and these times for me as well, uh, in the Minor Prophets where we go like, but this is not about me. Like, this is not about me. It doesn't involve me. Like, it already happens. Like, why do I care about this? And guess what? The Bible is not about you. <laughs> so you shouldn't have the, the attitude or the mentality that if it's not about me, it's not worthwhile. Like, Scripture is about God and knowing God and what God has done, what God has said. And so if you find yourself falling to that, that discouragement or that mindset, try to refresh yourself about what God's Word is for and what, what God's Word can do for you. Um, it's not all about you, uh, and, that's, and that's good. All right, five. The Minor Prophets. Why should we study the Minor Prophets? Because they point us more clearly to Christ. They point us more clearly to Christ. So one of the illustrations that's used to talk about how to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament is that you're in this room that's full of, of, of just beautiful decorations and gold and, and jewels, and it's just, it's just a beautiful room. But and this is the Old Testament, but the lights are down, are dim. Like you can't really see everything yet. Like you, can, you can know, like, wow, this is going to be really cool when all the lights are on all the way. And I can kind of already see that it's really beautiful. But you can't see all of it yet. And as, as Scripture progresses, as we get this progressive revelation, the lights just keep getting turned up a little bit more so that you understand and see God and his plan and his son. <coughs> the minor prophets help us turn up the lights a little bit in our understanding of Christ as we are moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament. A question that arises, especially for me as I study the Minor Prophets, but it arises um, is, is how. Like, how are these things going to be able to happen? Like, how is there going to be this restoration between God and man? Like, how are people going to be able to be in God's presence again in this entirely? This question of how, like, w where is that going to happen? How, who's going to do something to make that okay? These questions just kind of keep popping up over and over and over again. And there's places in, in the Minor Prophets that are really clearly talking about Christ, and we can see that. But even this idea of reconciliation with God is, is asking how. And as we learn more about God and his plan to, to reconcile people to himself in the Minor Prophets, we learn more about Christ. We see what Christ has done as something even greater. Uh, it, help, it helps us understand and grow in our appreciation of what happened on the cross, what had to happen, like what the awfulness of sin really is, and how amazing it is that, that Jesus died for our sin. We see that as we go through the, the minor prophets. Uh, I mean, the gospel was called a mystery, right? Like this marvelous mystery is slowly getting unveiled in the minor prophets. And then, I mean, Jesus walks in on the scene in the beginning of the gospels, and it's just like, that's how. Like that, wow. Look, John the Baptist, he's saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world right there. And all your questions as you're going through the Minor Prophets just get crystallized right there and you see it. The Minor Prophets uh, then point us that way. And so if you don't have the Minor Prophets or you don't have an understanding of the Minor Prophets, you just kind of have this, this blip. You're like, oh, things were like, not going well. And then whoop, Jesus is here. Great. Well, there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of context that happen. There's a lot of God's word that is, is said uh, between those moments. And so as we go through the minor prophets, I pray that you would grow in your understanding of God's word. Uh, you would grow in your, your faithfulness to him. Um, but that you would also just grow in your appreciation for Christ uh, and your desire to, to honor him and love him. Let me pray. And then if anybody has any questions, feel free to come up and ask me. Rick's over there, so if you have questions, you can ask him. That way he can't get out of the corner. Um, thank you all for coming out. This is a, a much bigger turnout than we were expecting in one sense, and so we're really thankful that you all desire to, to learn God's word better, uh, that you desire to be here in fellowship with one another. Uh, honestly, take time to, to meet somebody so you can have an accountability partner even as we go through this class. But let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you for the minor prophets in these 12 books that we're going to be able to dive into. 
uh, in, the, in these next uh, few months. I pray that you would give us desire to learn more about you, that your spirit would reveal your word clearly to us, that we would be amazed at your promises, uh, that we would see your mercy, we would see your, your grace uh, greater. I pray that we would uh, love, love your word, that we would love Christ more as we study. I pray that we'd also be able to apply these things in a practical way to our lives so that we can grow in our, in our walk, so that we can be more Christ-like, so that we can do the work that you have equipped us to do through your word. I pray uh, and thank you for tonight, Lord. Uh, I pray all this in your name. Amen.